speak or should I speak something else that I was not going to speak? Your choice. Huh? Your choice. My choice to choose. Okay. This is a verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam. It's from the first canto. 
chapter number 10. Minus verse number four. Kind of illustrates what is the ideal way to live according to Krishna's arrangement. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. 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 Among the verse of Arjanya Sarvakarma Dukarma Hi. CC2 sa CC2 sma vajam gavam prasa soda sava sabi muda. During the reign of Maharaj Yudhisthira, the clouds shower all the water that people need, and the earth produce all the necessities of man in profusion. Due to its fatty milk bag and cheerful attitude, the cow used to moisten the grazing ground with milk. So it says due to pious rule, when there is pious leadership in the society, then people can receive the benefit of Mother Earth. We say Mother Earth because she is, provides everything we need to live. It's not just a place we walk. It's a place where we get everything we need in order to live. So therefore, they say that as, as mother provides in the family, so Mother Earth provides the entire human family with everything needed to live happily and healthily. Sorry, um, audio. The uh, Zoom class, they are not able to hear, so I'm moving the speaker in front of the microphone. This is going to cause feedback anyway. Just pick it up, relax. Is it that one? Oh, shit. Okay, so I'll read some of the purport. Basic principle. Why did you do that? Hare Krishna. Okay. So this is a very interesting dis, uh, purport by His Divine Grace Srila Prabhupada. If you listen carefully, you'll understand that what Prabhupada is saying is the way Krishna wanted us to live. If you live, if we live according to how Krishna wants us to live, we live. Krishna is the all good, all knowing personality of Godhead, and he sets the standard for everything, both material and spiritual. <laughs> Since Maharaj Yudhisthira was under the protection of the infallible Lord, as mentioned above, the properties of the Lord, namely the rivers, oceans, hills, forests, etc., were all pleased. And they used to supply the respective quota of taxes to the king. The secret of success is to take refuge under the protection of the Supreme Lord. Without his sanction, nothing can be possible. That's why people can't understand why things don't happen according to their plan, because without the sanction of the Lord, nothing can happen. 
to make economic development by our own endeavors on the strength of tools and machinery is not all. The sanction of the Supreme Lord must be there. Otherwise, despite all in instrumental arrangements, everything will become unsuccessful. The ultimate cause of success is the Daivi, the Supreme King, like Maharaj Yudhisthira, who knew perfectly well that the king is the agent of the Supreme Lord to look after the welfare of the mass of people. And sometimes we say that there are seven mothers and one of the mothers is the wife of the king. She's also considered mother because the king is considered to be the, the father for all the praji, praja in the material world as the representative of the Lord. So if the king does not, or the king, the president, the ruler of the country is supposed to be the representative of the Lord to give the a sanction of the Lord's words direction for people in general. Hmm. Actually, actually, the state belongs to the Supreme Lord. Okay. The rivers, oceans, forests, hills, and drugs, etc., are not creations of man. They are creations of the Supreme Lord. And the living being is allowed to use them in the property of the Lord for the service of the Lord. Today's slogan is that everything is for the people, therefore the government is for the people and by the people. But to produce a new species of humanity at the present moment on the basis of God consciousness and perfection of human life, the ideology of godly communism, the world has given follow the world has to again follow in the footsteps of kings like Maharaj Yudhisthira or Maharaj Pariksit. There is enough of everything by the will of the Lord. There's no shortages. And we can make proper use of things to live comfortably without enmity between men or animal or man and nature, between men and men, animal and animal, man and man and nature. To control the control of the Lord is everywhere, and if the Lord is pleased, every part of the creation or nature is pleased. The river will flow profusely to fertilize the land. The oceans will supply sufficient quantities of minerals, pearls, and jewels. The forests will supply sufficient food, uh, sufficient wood, I'm sorry, drugs and vegetables. And the seasonal changes will effectively help produce fruits and flowers and produce quantity. The artificial way of living depending on factories and tools can render so-called happiness only to a limited number at the cost of millions. Since the energy of the mass of people is engaged in factory production, the natural products are being hampered and for this the mass is unhappy. The mass of people are unhappy. Without being educated properly, the mass of people are following in the footsteps of the vested interests by exploiting natural resources. And therefore, there is an acute competition between individual and individual and nation and nation. <coughs> There is no control by the trained agent of the Lord. We must look into the defects of modern civilization by comparison and should follow into, wait a minute, I read the wrong purport. <laughs> this is the purport from the next verse. <laughs> I read one verse and read the second purport, and this is interesting. Anyway, we must look into the defects of modern civilization by comparison and should follow in the footsteps of Maharaj Yudhisthira to cleanse man and wipe out anachronisms. Hmm. Hmm. Should I read the other purport? This is the one I was supposed to read. The basic principle of economic development is centered on land and cows. Pretty good cow, huh? 
I'm practicing for my next life. <laughs> the necessities of human society are food grains, fruits, milk, minerals, clothing, and wood. One requires all these items to fulfill the material needs of the body. <laughs> Certainly one does not require flesh and fish or iron and industry. During the regime of Maharaj Yudasi, all over the world, there was regulated rainfall. So what is regulated rainfall means? According to regulated rainfall, it would only rain in the evening. That is ideal. And then when the sun would come out the next day, the ground would be wet and the sun would nourish all of the forest, the trees, the vegetables, the fruits, everything was nourished by the presence of the sun after rainfall comes in the evening. But now you see it rains whenever it rains. And sometimes it doesn't rain or sometimes you get too much rain. So why is the, the climate so erratic? Because people are not following the laws of God. <laughs> the earth simply works under the direction of the Lord. And when everyone lives according to the, the direction of the Lord, the earth supplies everything according to the perfection of the Lord's arrangement for the earth. In other words, everything works nicely. So it would rain at night. And there would be no disturbance by rainfall. And then the next morning when the sun could come out, everything was nourished by the presence of the sun. So that, that was in such a yuga. Of course, Kali Yuga, everything is upside down. Rainfalls are not in the control of the human being. The heavenly king Interdave is the controller of the rains, and he is the servant of the Lord. When the Lord is obeyed by the king and the people under the king's administration, there are regulated rains from the horizon, and the rains are the cause of varieties of production on the land. I'll tell you a little story. In 1993, we were, we had a little preaching center in one city in America called Cincinnati, Ohio. And I was the temple, you might say temple commander, kind of temple president. And so we had, uh, we needed some work done on our taxes. And so we filed for some 503 C, 501 C, yeah, and we needed a lawyer to help us, so we found this an interesting lawyer, his name was Bill Cunningham, so Mr. Cunningham came to help us, but we also found out that Mr. Cunningham also was a disc jockey, along with being a lawyer, and he used to run a radio show every day from 9 a.m. to noon, and it was a talk show where he would invite what he could consider to be interesting guests. And then they would discuss, you know, what the guest was about. So he came and he somehow or like other liked our program. So he asked me to come on his radio show. Now this radio show covered 38 states and there were, there were more than 45 million people listening. It was a big program. So here I am, little Hare Krishna, coming on this big radio show. And this Mr. Bill Cunningham, he was an interesting personality. He liked to joke around. <laughs> and it gets part of his program also. He jokes on the air. So he was, you know, asking me different questions about who we were, what is Hare Krishna and everything like that. And so 
uh, I stayed on for half the show because they divided the show into two parts. And so I was on first. And when I was on, he asked me, he said, you know, we would really like you to sing the Hare Krishna chant. And we'll use that as a recording to break the stations for the commercials. I said, great. So I did my thing. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Hare Rama. We'll be back in a moment, folks. <laughs> so he liked that, so he recorded it, and then he was using it. <laughs> Even when I was on the, it wasn't on the air. So then he found out I was connected to the New Vrindavan farm community in West Virginia. So he wanted me to contact the devotees there, the leader there, and he wanted to do a bigger program in the future. And so there was some uh, idea, but no date. <clears throat> so what happened in around the month of May of 1993, is there was calamities all over the United States, mm -hmm. agricultural problems, droughts on one side, uh, fires, fires on the other side, all kinds of severe ec uh, ecological disasters were happening. And right where we were, there was no rain. <clears throat> it hadn't rained in three months. And this is right in the middle of the farm belt where, where all the farmers are, Ohio, Illinois, Pennsylvania, right in that area. <clears throat> So he asked us to come on at that time, and he said, bring some of the leaders from the West Virginia community. So I said, fine. Now, this drought was quite severe, where in that area, anyone who was using water to water their lawns would be fined money. Washing their cars, they would also get a fine. So no one could use water other than absolute necessities was really restricted. And it was an emergency. They had tried to do everything to bring rain, but no rain. So now he invited us and I came with four other devotees, including the head of the New Vrindavan community. And we were on, and just a half hour into the program, he was talking to the leader of the communion, at that time was Kirtananda Swami. And he said, can you guys make it rain? And Kirtananda Swami said, yes. Now, he became shocked. He said, you know, there's millions of people out there listening, and you're going to be known as a false prophet. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, because, you know, our reputation would be, you know, they would think we were just useless. But Kirtananda Swami said, no, we can make it rain. Really? He got excited. How? He said, well, it's very easy. We'll chant Hare Krishna and it'll rain. He said, oh, that's it? And then he said, and we said, well, no, that's not the whole thing. We'll chant Hare Krishna, but everyone in Radio Land, all the listeners, they have to chant with us. And if that happens, there'll be rain. And he got really excited. He said, hear that, folks? The Swami's going to make it rain. Come on, let's chant. So he got all jacked up. And he starts to, you know, really get the audience going. Come on, sing with the Swami. So we're singing, you know, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. So we were doing that for about three or four minutes. And while we were doing that, he's, he's really pumping up the audience. Come on, chant with the Swami, we're going to make it rain. So we started to, he started to, you know, really get the audience going. 
So that was about 9.30 in the morning. We were on for the full three hours that day. So about 11.30, uh, now Dayton, Ohio is about 50 miles away from Cincinnati. So <clears throat> there's the weather reporters, they roam around in their cars and they send reports into their stations. And so one weather report came in and was, hey, Bill, there's some clouds up here. <laughs> and was, his name was Bill. <laughs> and so uh, that was the first sign. And then the show ended at noon. At 2.30 that day, it rained, and it rained for three days straight. Wow. <laughs> Continuously. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you can imagine how popular we became. <laughs> <laughs> and so Bill got really excited, and he was so happy, he went to the mayor. And he had some connections with the mayor. I was a Cincinnati, and he said, we have to award these Hare Krishnas. They made it rain. So the, the mayor agreed. So we received the key to the city, which is really, you know, they get this big, big giant styrofoam key, you know, <laughs> with a ribbon on it. <laughs> and when very unceremoniously, they presented us with the key. <laughs> and so that was good. Now, I should also mention that you're not supposed to use the holy name for anything material. Papa talks about when he was a little boy, he was one and a half years old. The year was 1898. And in Calcutta, there was a plague, a very severe plague. Yeah, and people were dying in the streets by the hundreds. And so everyone... They tried everything to stop the plague, but they couldn't stop it. So one Babaji, he decided to organize Harinam Sankirtan. And he did, and he was going in and out of the homes, chanting with a group of other Kirtaniyars. And after some time, the whole plague was gone. You get the point? You want this so-called, you know, coronavirus. it is coronavirus to go away. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna Krishna. We need more people to do it. <laughs> So that this is, and this is what is being said here, when, when there is devotion to the Lord, or when people are at least pious, pious is not even devotional. It means you live in a very proper way, according to moral and religious principles. That's piety. You are charitable. You're kind to others. You don't cause harm to others. You know, you follow religious principles. Um, you are generous. These are some of the qualities of a pious person. You make your home a place where the Lord is worshipped. When people live like that, no problem. Even if they're not so devotion, if they're least pious, then the land will change and everything will change. Because as Prabhupada said, Mother Nature is Mother. And if, you know, if you don't follow your mother, what happens? <laughs> you get slapped, right? That's what's supposed to happen anyway. <laughs> but mother is kind because that slap is for your benefit. <laughs> and so when the living entities who are children, a, 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 a dumb, what is it? Adam Pitam 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 What is that? What is that verse? No. Aham Aham Pitam What is that? Huh? Aham Bicha Pitam Pitam Krishna is the seed giving father of all living entity. We are his children. And Mother Nature is the mother. Krishna is the father, and Mother Nature is the mother. 
and we are the children. So we depend, if we follow father, then mother is happy and she provides everything we need. We disobey the father, then mother slaps us this way and that way. <laughs> so that's actually what it's, it's not some, you know, just some euphemism or some nice way to describe things. It's actually to correct how we should live. So when people are seeing God as the most important part of their life and following the principles that God laid down, then the world is happy, the world is peaceful. But that's not the case. People don't want to follow God. They want to follow their own selfish ways and therefore there's always problems. <laughs> okay, so we'll go on with this particular verse here. Not only do regulated rains help ample production of grains and fruits, but when they combine with astrological influences, there is ample production of valuable stones and pearls. Now, this is interesting. Did you get that? Did you hear what I just read? read? Not only just food, but also the other precious material like uh, diamonds and pearls. And pearls. pearls. Yeah. Now, it says under a certain astrological arrangement when it rains that rain when it falls on the head of a snake turns into a gem when it falls on the head of an elephant it also turns into gems and when it falls into the seas it becomes pearls and that's where you get oysters they take those pearls and then they're very valuable so rain under certain astrological arrangements produces gems yeah, rain, simply by rain itself and the constellations aligned at a certain time, you get gems, you get diamonds, you get pearls, you get all of these valuable jewels. This is how Mother Nature works. You might say, well, you know, people are looking for these things, but this is how it happens. These things are produced by God through rain. Grains and vegetables can sumptuously feed a man and animals, and a fatty cow delivers enough milk to supply a man sumptuously with vigor and vitality. Now they have this thing called, uh, what is it? Ahims, not ahims, but vegan, right? Vegan, you know, all this. Why do people think this is good? Because Krishna has tricked them because they kill the cow and therefore they are sinful, they cannot benefit from the cow's milk. So this, this philosophy of veganism has been created to punish people. They cannot get the benefits of the milk because they are killing the cows and exploiting the animals. And therefore they come up with this philosophy that milk is not healthy. But milk supplies finer brain tissues, which are necessary to understand spiritual topics milk is not of course not too much if you drink too much milk just like we were in Nubrindavan and we had so many cows at one time we had 550 cows and we had we had a huge dairy we were supplying many of the stores in the area with sufficient amount of milk and we were making enough money simply by milk productions and then, and then in the evening, we would have the meal would be popcorn and milk. <laughs> they were all brahmacharis. It wasn't like, you know, there was pizza and pakoras <laughs> and, like and, and uh, Chinese noodles. <laughs> <laughs> it was always just popcorn and milk. And so that was a little austere. And so the devotees would drink a lot of milk. We would have these big, big aluminum bowls and the devotees would fill it up with milk. And milk was creamy. You didn't even need sugar. It was so tasty. It was just pure cream and milk coming right directly from the cow's pen, just warmed up to make it nice and healthy. And devotees were drinking. But then guess what? Everybody got sick. <laughs> Too much and Prabhupada came right after that and he said, You're drinking too much milk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
okay. So then Prabhupada, you know, said, no more than one pound and no less than one half pound of milk per day is sufficient for each and every individual. So what is one pound? It's 17.2 ounces. And one half pound of obviously is half of that. But then Prabhupada qualified that and said, that means all milk products. In other words, if you take burfi, you take rubbery, you take Pani. yogurt, paneer, all that cannot exceed that, that quantity of 17.2 ounces together. Of course, that's hard to calculate. <laughs> but this is what Prabhupada's understanding. And then, of course, after some time, the devotees got better. But during the time of getting better, we had to go undergo a very austere diet. And that diet was miserable. <laughs> we know what we were taking. The devotees had gotten, uh, I don't know what, so many. We had to take brown, no, no, no. We had to take rice and mung dal water. That's all, not mung dal, just the water from the dal and plain rice with no salt. Every meal. Because <laughs> everybody got sick from too much milk. and Because uh, too much of a good thing is also not good. Too little of a good thing is also not good. Life is what is called the, the, the medium. You know, it's called, the, what is that called? Balance. The balance, yeah. not too much, not too little. And that, that's generally true with things in general. <clears throat> there, there are three things. There's three things you should always be satisfied with. And there's three things you should never be satisfied with. Which one would you like to hear first? So you should be satisfied with, listen up men, okay, wife, food, and money. In other words, you should be happy with your wife no matter what. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Even if she burns the food, don't complain. <laughs> of course, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> Wife, food, and money. Money means we should not be greedy for money. We should use our energy time for becoming Krishna consciousness and then take up an occupation to maintain our family and not become greedy for more and more and more. So these are the three things you should always be satisfied with. And three things you should never be satisfied with. And one is chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Two, hearing the glories of the Lord. And three, giving in charity. So this is Chanaka Pandit. He's saying these three things. You can't get enough of chanting Hare Krishna. You can't get enough of hearing the glories of the Lord. And there's no limit to giving in charity. Well, service is not counted. Yeah. Service is not counted in the three that we should never be satisfied with. Our he could talk to Chanaka. He, he made it up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just repeating what he did. I'm not the, I'm not the author. <laughs> I guess when you can say the chanting the glories of the Lord is also service. Yes, service is not. Mm -hmm. So these are the things we should learn to be said. <clears throat> Here, Prabhupada goes on to say, if there's enough milk, enough grains, enough fruit, enough cotton, enough silk, enough jewels, then why do people need cinema houses, houses of prostitution and slaughterhouses? What is the need of an artificial luxurious life of cinema, cars, radio, flesh, and hotels? Has this civilization produced anything but quarreling individually and nationally? Has this civilization enhanced the cause of equality and fraternity by sending thousands of men into the hellish factory and the war fields at the whims of a particular man? 
It is said here that the cows used to moisten the pasturing ground with, with milk and their backs were fatty and the animals were joyful. Do they require, therefore, proper protection for a joyful life by being, by being fed with sufficient quality of grass in the field? So a cow, what does it do? It doesn't take much, little grass and produces the most miracle food filled milk and cow dung. You take your cow dung, you dry it out. Some of you, were, I'm sure, were born in India, right? You mix it with the patty, you dry it out, you slap it on the side of the wall until you need it, <laughs> and then you cook. Prabhupada said, first, first class cooking is with cow dung. Second, wood. Third, gas. Fourth, Electricity. Electricity, which is destroying the environment. When I was a brahmachari, I used to be a cook. I was the head cook of the kitchen. I was the head cook because I was the only cook. <laughs> <laughs> there was no problem then. <laughs> But I used to cook with wood. We used to have devotees go out into the, the woods and they would bring in the wood. We, sometimes it was wet and we'd dry it out and then we would cook. And I used to cook on wood stove. And so there, seemed, there seems to be an added flavor to the milk when you cook in a more natural way or not and more an added, added flavor to the food when you cook more naturally. Artificial cooking such gas is now accepted as okay, because that's all. But in, in just like I, I spent a lot of time in Europe, and people still cook on wood stoves in Europe. And if you look at everybody's houses, they all heat their houses with wood. They, of course, they have these very regular, what we say, radiators, but it's all fed with wood. And they have the pipes that the heat through the system like that. The wood heats the water and water heats the house. Yeah, exactly. Exactly like that. And you don't have to pay. All you have to do is one part of the year gather some wood and you have enough for the whole year. Like that. So, but wood, God provides all that automatically. He's showing us what is the natural way to live. But there's no industry in wood. Of course, there can be. But people think well, the idea is to take everything and use it as a commodity. So whatever you need, they sell it to you when it's already available. Because we live in these artificial houses and we don't grow any food. We don't have any cows. We don't do any. So we have to go out and work and then get that piece of paper, what we say called money, like that. We don't even get nowadays that piece of paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that they you know, give you, you know, we, we debit your account and we credit your account. And then if we don't like you, we zero you out your account. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the future. It's the present also in some cases. And so now everything, it has to be under the control of higher authority. People can't live day to day with the basic needs, which is the human rights and which is God. God has set it up naturally. That's why he's given everything. But now industry has taken all the, the resources of the land and commoditize it and sell it back to you in the form of, of you know what you need to live. So you see how we live in a very artificial lifestyle. And therefore, people are not healthy. People are not healthy. I, I spent time in Europe. Many of the countries that I've been in, people who were in the communist regime for like 20, 30 years. And these people are healthy. Why? Because during that time, there wasn't capitalism selling them everything. People were working the land. They were, the, even the ladies were out there working nicely. And people were healthy and still are healthy. Of course, that's now changing with modern civilization. But here in America, <clears throat> you know, everybody's lazy. <laughs> Push a button and everything happens, right? You know, 
but nobody's healthy. <laughs> you get sick so easy nowadays. Because if you want to stay healthy, you got to be active. <laughs> you got to need fresh air, activity, you know, like that. But nobody's out, you know, all we do, we stay in these air-conditioned offices and everybody gets diabetes. Right? <laughs> diabetes is caused by not perspiring. If you perspire, you get rid of the impurities in the body. But one of the causes of diabetes is staying in air-conditioned offices all day and looking at a screen. <laughs> I can't see anymore. I, I wonder why. <laughs> it's, you know, it's like, it's, this is the way we are. It's like we're robots almost. Yeah. Like kids are wearing glasses when they're like really young nowadays. Even the small kids have glasses because they can't see anything looking at computer screens. Anyway, let's all go back to what Prabhupada is saying here. He says here, why should men kill cows for their selfish purposes? Why should man not be satisfied with grains, fruit, and milk, which combined together can produce hundreds and thousands of palatable dishes, right, ladies? If you have grains, if you have fruit and vegetables and milk, you can cook so many products, right? And these are natural. Prabhupada said, the food grown on our own farms is 100 times more nutritious than the stuff you buy in the stores. Because they, you know, they grow it on these all with pesticides and all these various types of, they want to kill the bugs, but they kill everything else, including the person who eats the food. <laughs> really, and food is tasteless. In India, you see a lot of the, you know, the factory farms in India now, you know, you get a vegetable and there's no taste to it. <laughs> if you take, if you have food that you grow in your own gardens or on our own farms, and the whole thing is bhakti, this is an important point, that when you go out there, you till the ground, and then you plant the seed, and then you cultivate the seed, you grow the plant, and then when the plant is ready, you take the fruit from the plant, then you take it, you wash it, you cook it, you offer it to the deity, and then that's prashada. From the very beginning, it's prashada, it's bhakti, because the whole activity is bhakti from the very beginning. What we get is we buy the vegetable from the store, we cook it, and we offer it, and that's prashada. And you can see the difference. And you'll see the difference in food. I've had this experience of tasting food that has been grown on our own farms. I'm sure some of you also have. And you can see it's, it's much more tastier, much more nutritious. Now, what do we get? Just like water, they put it in a bottle, they mix it with tap water, and they call it spring water. <laughs> the only thing that springs is your brain. That's the only thing that springs. I live, I stay in Slovenia and I get water from the rivers. We have, there is many natural water resources in these European countries that are still good. And I don't drink bottled water. I don't see any plastic. <laughs> plastic is just, it's just, you know, it's just, what is plastic? It's, it's very artificial. It's made with oil. So in order to make plastic, you need to use oil, which is take coming from the land also. And uh, most of the water you get is not healthy. It's just, and put it in plastic bottles, and then, then the health goes down. So we, we get glass or metal containers, and we gather water from the streams in, in, in Slovenia and Croatia. In some of these European countries are still have the natural resources available. And so, of course, you could, I don't know if you can do it here. There was one lady, <clears throat> she was a devotee, yeah. and uh, she got cancer, and she was living in Italy. Now, she was living in an area where there was a church, and in that church, there was a, a natural water floral, which was very, very wonderful water. And it would come up 
to a particular place within the church environment. And then it was you, people would come and fill up their bottles. She got cancer. So I told her, drink that water all the time. And she did. And after some time, the cancer went away just by drinking the water. That's all. Yeah. She said, my cancer's gone. She was drinking very, this, this water was a miracle water. It was, people were coming from all over Italy just to come to this place to get this water and filling up their, you know, 10 gallon, you know, jugs with water, using it for cooking. I think Abby has a plan to dig, to dig a well in the backyard. That's good, getting water from the underground streams. That's pure water. And then you can use it for cooking in New Rajadam in our in Hungary and our in that community there. They stopped taking water from the outside. All the water now is from wells. So they, they found so many water resources that dug wells, and now the devotees don't get any water from taps. They simply have these big, big giant containers, and once a day they go into the wells and fill them up. And it's good for a couple of days. And then when it runs out, even in the wintertime. So they bathe with that water, they cook with that water, and they drink that water, and it's just pure water. Water is more like elixir. It's exactly nourishing when you get natural water. As opposed to, you know, this stuff that they sell, in the, well, even the stuff in the tap is. There's some places where you turn on the tap and uh, you can you put a flame underneath the tap, and it goes whoosh, because oh, what's coming? Yeah, gas is coming out of the, the, the yeah. because they have ruined the underground supply of water by drilling into the earth for natural gas, and the gas mixes in with the water stream. And you turn on your faucet, you get you know gaseous water. <laughs> really. I've seen, I have, we have a one hour video that showed this whole thing. So this is part of uh, progress. <laughs> so people are suffering because of bad leadership. And therefore what is natural was given by God as being usurped and redirected as an economic commodity but in a perverted and a very polluted way. So here we'll go on to it. And Prabhupada says, why are there slaughterhouses all over the world to kill innocent animals? This is, do you have the, uh, anybody have the seventh canto of Srimad Bhagavatam? You want to know why we have this pandemic? This verse will tell you. Oh, everything is there in Bhagavatam. Uh, uh, Atarva, you find a verse, 71524. Would you like to read it? I'll read it also. 24. Yeah, 24. 7, 15, 24. Here, you can take my microphone. And... My good behavior and freedom from envy, one should counteract suffering due to other living entities by meditation and trance, one should counteract suffering due to providence. And by practicing uh, uh, hatha yoga, pra, uh, pranayam, and so forth, one should uh, counteract sufferings due to the body and mind. Similarly, by developing the mode of goodness, especially in regard to eating, one should conquer sleep. Okay. Yeah. 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 By practice, one should avoid eating in such a way that other living entities will be disturbed and suffer. Since I suffer when pinched or killed, uh, by others, I should not attempt to pinch or kill any living entity. People do not know that because of killing innocent animals, they themselves will have to suffer a severe reaction from material nature. Any country where people indulge in unnecessary killing of animals will have to suffer from wars and pestilence imposed by material nature. 
comparing one's own suffering to the suffering of others, therefore one should be kind to all living entities. One cannot avoid the sufferings inflicted by providence, and therefore when suffering comes, one should, one should fully absorb oneself in chanting the Hare Krishna Mantra. Um, one can avoid suffering from the body and mind by practicing mystic Hatha Yoga. So by killing animals, one brings about unnecessary wars and pestilence. These are all due to sinful activities. How many animals are killed every day in these slaughterhouses? We, it's just horrendous. Can't even count. Millions. Millions worldwide, hundreds of thousands, and even in America. So where does that sinful reaction go? It goes on to the population. Because although the leaders and the, what we say, the uh, corporations are involved in doing that, people are sanctioning that and going along with it. And therefore they also get the reactions. That's why I say this, epi this pandemic is not for the devotees, it's just for the non-devotees who are engaged in sinful activities or supporting sinful activities by buying into that same lifestyle. If you buy, if you eat meat, you are sanctioning the killing of animals. <laughs> so that verse is quite, what we say, prophetic. Srila Prabhupada is saying, these things happen because of, of the slaughter of innocent animals. Okay, here. Maharaj Pariksit, grandson of Maharaj Yudhisthir, was touring his vast kingdom. He saw a black man attempting to kill a cow. The king at one arrested the butcher and chastised him sufficiently. Should not a king or executive head protect the lives of the poor animals who are unable to defend themselves? Is this humanity? Are not the animals of a country citizens also? Then why are they allowed to be butchered in organized slaughter slaughterhouses? Are these the signs of equality, fraternity, and nonviolence? Therefore, in contrast with the modern advanced civilized form of government, an, auto, auto, an autocracy like Maharaj Yudhisthira is by far superior to the so-called democracy in which animals are killed, and a man less than an animal is allowed to cast votes for another less than an animal man. We are creatures of material nature. And Bhagavad Gita said that the Lord himself is the seat-giving father, and material nature is the mother of all living beings in all shapes. Thus, Mother Nature has enough foodstuffs for animals and for men. And by the grace of the Father Almighty, Sri Krishna, the human being is the elder brother of all other living beings. That's what it says, that the humans are, have dominion over animals. It means protection, not doesn't mean to uh, exploitation. Human civilization... A, he is endowed with intel because the human being is endowed with intelligence more powerful than the animal for realizing the course of nature and the indications of the Almighty Father. Human civilization should depend on the production of material nature without artificially attempting economic development to turn the world into a chaos of artificial greed and power only for the purpose of artificial luxuries and sense gratification. This is but the life of dogs and hogs. So that's why Prabhupada is very strong. You say we live in a civilization of animals because people don't know what is the value of life nor know how to live it. So during the year 1977, or actually even before then, around the year 1974, Prabhupada started to really uh, emphasize Vanashram Dharma. Vanashram Dharma is to organize the society according to people's propensity. People are Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Sudras, but Kalos Sudra Sambhavan, which means that in this age, people are born with sutra qualities, but therefore with training, one's natural propensities will come out. 
So if one has the propensity of a Brahmin, it remains Gupta or hidden. And with proper training, that these qualities are coming out. To train, to observe, train, educate, and observe, and then engage people according to their nature and balance that out in the social environment, then you have a functioning society. And so that was, and Prabhupada said, this has to be done in a natural environment, not in the cities, he said, in the farm communities. So Prabhupada said, we need to develop our farms because on the farms we can grow food, take care of cow. Now cow, people think cow is just a good economic necessity, but it's much more than that. In fact, the economic advantages that the cow gives is subordinate to the actual cow's real purpose. Cow is dharma. She is dharma. And to protect cow means to protect dharma. And there's a, there's a verse that says, if you protect dharma, dharma will protect you. Dharma rakshita rakshitaha. Dharma rakshita rakshitaha. Yeah, if you protect dharma, dharma will protect you. So the, one of the most important principles of protection of dharma is to protect the cows because cows are auspicious. Simply by walking on the fields with their hooves, they actually fertilize the ground. And they make that ground, you know, you know, fertile for growing crops. That's how auspicious cows are. Every part of the body of the cow is actually connected with a particular demigod. That's why it says that actually the, the cow is the embodiment of all the devas in one Cow is very auspicious. And even from the religious and spiritual point of view, we when we do worship of the Supreme Lord, what do we do? We do, sometimes we do panchagavya, which is the five substances from the cow. What is that? Milk, yogurt, ghee, cow urine, and cow dung. This is panchagavya. And we actually bathe the deity the sacred deity with cow urine and cow dung. You know, I guess the materialists would freak out thinking, you know, how could you put cow stool on a, a worshipful object? But they don't understand the value and the sanctity of the cow. What is the name of Krishna's planet? Golok, the planet of the cows. The Supreme Personality of Godhead has named his place in the spiritual world, the place of the cows. <laughs> so it's not just an animal that's very auspicious, it's very saintly. And if you take care of cows nicely, if you provide for their livelihood, not simply try to get what you can from what they give, but provide with their livelihood, then you're actually you're practicing true dharma, or real dharma. Then. So Prabhupada said we should develop our own farms and protect cows and also use the cows and the bull. The bull is also known as father. The bull also helps to provide everything. He is the workforce. And so training bulls, oxing, using them to plow the land. Now, when you develop that type of lifestyle, you don't have to work the whole year. When people, uh, once that lifestyle is developed and it's moving in a certain way, you can work four months a year and you have enough food for the whole year. Those four months you need for planting and for cultivating and for reaping, and then you have everything you need for the entire year. And you have that even excess where you can trade with others who do the same thing and get other products with that. Now, this is actually how Krishna has arranged everything to go on, but unfortunately, we live in a very dysfunctional lifestyle. We have these big houses and so many nice cars and so many nice things, but people are not happy. In general, people are not happy. 
you know, I was out walking this morning. I was doing my jumper walk. And I was seeing a few people. People don't look happy. And this is a this is a very, very upper class neighborhood. They have everything material. And you can see, you can tell just by looking at a person whether they're happy or not. See that lady in the back sitting against the wall? She's always happy. <laughs> and she doesn't, well, maybe she does have a nice car, but still she's happy. <laughs> so happiness is the feature of the living being's natural propensity. To be happy is natural. It's not like something you have to work for to get. Happiness is the nature of the soul's existence. And what makes you happy is, is relationships. When you have proper relationships with other living entities, which starts with our relationship with God, then we are happy. But nobody has relationships with anybody. Everybody tries to use each other in order to get something from themselves. And that's called marriage. <laughs> when you get married to see what that person can give you not what you can give that other person. Of course, there's a give and take program, but the motivation is to take. And therefore, people are never satisfied in relationships because everyone is trying to take. So people think, well, I have to give in order to take, so therefore I'll give. But the whole program is to get. That's why people are not happy because they're always trying, they're always thinking, what's in it for me? If you put God first and you put other people first, you're happy. You, you, whatever you need will come automatically by serving God and by serving others. But people think me first, you know, you know, you see everybody's got that number one, um, number one, so many number ones, but as far as I know, the in the in the number system, there's only one number one. <laughs> And he knows who he is. He's Krishna. <laughs> We're all number two. <laughs> Minimum. <More than 100. laughs> all the way down the line. So relationships are the basis of happiness. And therefore, no one's happy because no one has good relationships. Whenever there is good relationships, it's usually based on something temporary. And then things change quickly. Yeah. So when we make Krishna the number one object of our life, then it becomes, everything becomes nice. Krishna's first. And of course, we put Krishna's devotees in the same category as Krishna. We serve Krishna and Krishna's devotees. And we know that simply by doing that, we become happy because service is the natural propensity of the living entity. No one can get away from service, even in the material sense. Everyone is serving something. And we just you just look at how people live, and you see there is some object that they're serving in order to get something from it. But that's business. <laughs> when you serve, because actually service is it, it makes the, the soul happy. One one finds happiness in the service itself and not so much what you get from the service. That's, that, is the, that is the actual nature of the living being's happiness. When we think, oh, what can I give? And you automatically get, even in the material sense, there was a survey that was done many years ago, and they wanted to determine what, what type of people are the happiest type of people. Now, this was done on a material level, not spiritual level. And the conclusion was, this was in America, that uh, people who are, are busy and they're serving other people are the most happiest people. And, that's, and then they, uh, one year they were going around the world to see which country was the happiest country. You know which country it was? Bangladesh. <laughs> yeah. This even came out in the in the natural, you know, statistics. Bangladesh was considered to be the happiest country in the world. The United States never made it. <laughs> One hundred and sixty-three. One hundred out of all the countries. Yeah, U.S. is one sixty. Yeah, we're going down the list. <laughs> 
uh, if there's more than if the numbers are even extended lower and lower. So this is because everyone has material things, but they don't know what is the purpose of life. So this particular verse in purport here, Prabhupada's giving us the foundation of how or this type of lifestyle or the lifestyle that Krishna organized is actually the way to live. Living in community is actually better than living in these nuclear families where you have one guy who's the husband, one girl who's the wife, and a couple kids running around. <laughs> You're all from India, you know, you, many of you grew up in, in what they call the extended families. You might think, well, that was difficult. But for women, it was great. Maybe the men had more hard times. The women were really happy then because when they, when they had a child, that child had many, many mothers. Had many, many mothers. And all the burden was not uh, simply on the mother to take care of the child. It says, in the Shastra, it takes uh, it takes a village to raise uh, raise a child, you know, properly like that. So I'm not saying we should go back to village life, but we, but we should more be, become more in tune with a more communal type lifestyle where devotees work together in an organized way to support the needs of each other and to worship together. When you worship together, it's nice. The more people worship together, the nicer and the more happy or more, what we say, joyful that worship becomes. And so Prabhupada has given us a really clear understanding. And he did say, he said, we have to make these uh, farm communities because he said the cities won't last. He said, People will be dying in the thousands in the cities. He says this lifestyle is meant to be destroyed. It's artificial. It's going on simply. It's not even going on anymore. <laughs> you know, now, now people are being forced to, to comply to all kinds of strange rules and regulations. And the government is becoming more more and more in everyone's life now. You can't do anything without the government. Just like I, I go to the UK and you know I, I associate with many of the Indian families in the UK. And 40% of the income that they make from the gross income goes to the government. Taxes. 40% in taxes. I don't know, here it's a little less, right? Depends on the earning potential, but yes, it is. It can start from twenty and it can go up to forty. Yeah, it's in, and if you make over a hundred thousand pounds, it's fifty percent. So you work for the government. <laughs> what do they do with the money? They start a war in some country, and <laughs> so, on. so yeah. And then they give you this thing called paper money. It's a piece of paper with this funny-looking guy on it. <laughs> You don't even know who he is. You don't care who he is. Either. <laughs> and then once in a while, they put a lady on there to give you a little variety. <laughs> <laughs> who is she? We don't know. They, they took a picture of somebody walking on the street and put him on. <laughs> so, you know, some hero, what did he do? George Washington, he's famous for cutting down a cherry tree. You know? One, this is the father of the country. This is the father of the country is called George Washington. What did the guy do? He died of syphilis, <laughs> venereal disease. So this is you know, this is uh, who we worship. <laughs> so um, yeah, well, unless we get back to a God-centered society, and devotees have to see that our material life is. Is, is needed, but our spiritual life is, is really life. And there has to be the emphasis, coming together and working together, not simply to worshiping together, but also sharing time and energy together to support each other, 
If you can do it in the city environment, that's okay. But if you can do it in a more natural environment, it's sustainable because the cities are not so sustainable. Mm -hmm. And anytime, you know, the electricity can go out, the gas can shut off, the water can go, the food supply is going. Uh, these, all these are in the hand, not in the hands of us. It's in the hands of the government, or you might say in the hands of big business. So we're under the control of these greedy leaders who are simply trying to squeeze as much as you can from the people. I remember I was going, did you notice that there are more and more taxes now? Is that true? Nobody's saying it. Huh? Yeah, like more, more and more tariffs, taxes, fees, right? Where are you saying? Prices are going up. Prices are going up. That means inflation means more unemployment. More unemployment means more crime. And so I remember I was traveling in the in the airport one day, and I went to check in to go to flying one country to another. So when I went in there, I was overweight. So the lady said, "You'll have to pay twenty nine euros more for the overweight." And I said, "Fine." So I'm about to give her the money. She said, "No, no, we have a um, you know a cashier over there. You go there." And she wrote me out a slip, 29 euros that I had to pay, and I handed the slip. So I went there and I put the slip down with 29 euros I had. She said, that'll be 34 euros. I said, 29 is the price. She said, well, we charge five euros to process. <laughs> and I said, I don't really want your process. You know? <laughs> she said, 34 euros <laughs> so just to pay i had to pay to pay <laughs> so they're always thinking how to put more and more taxes more. so pretty soon you'll go to work and you'll come home they'll take your check and they'll say you still owe us money <laughs> <laughs> because the Bhagavatam does say that. It says that the governments will squeeze people so much in Kali Yuga that people will leave their hearts at home and go to the forest to simply live, to get away from these high, high taxes and, and inflation. Inflation is another form of taking your money. And so, Because I'll, I'll tell you a story that happened in Croatia. The government there is also broke. <laughs> Because this whole epidemic or pandemic has cost governments to spend a lot of money. So now they're trying to get it back from the citizens. So um, I have a, a disciple and he, he runs a business where he buys Indian foodstuffs from, um, you know, like dal rice and various spices and different Indian foodstuffs from Europe, uh, from the UK, and he has it shipped to uh, Croatia. And he sells it to, host, to wholesalers, like different restaurants and different places. And so he gets a call from one government agency in Croatia. And it's a lady. And she said, we have heard that your rice is not up to the standard. He's selling basmati rice. And therefore, I'm coming to inspect your rice. And if it's not up to the standard, you have to pay a fine of 7,000 euros. So he said, well, my wife is pregnant and she has a doctor's appointment today. So I'm not available today. So can we reschedule? She said, no, I'm coming today. You'd be there. <laughs> okay, so she came. Now, this devotee is really good with people. He changes people fast. He makes them all positive. So when he came, he just was smiles and he made her feel so nice. And then finally, after being with him for a while, she didn't inspect the rice. And then she said, you know, my boss has made me do this work. 
And she showed the letter that her boss wrote. He said, get money from these small little businesses because the government, or we need the money. So find discrepancies so we can find people and get money. She showed the letter. She said, if I didn't do this, I would have lost my job. So we gave her some prashadam. She went home happy. And she reported, these people are okay. <laughs> so she actually revealed what she was doing simply because of this person. He's, if you meet him, you'll know what I mean. He, he knows him really good. He's the one that gets me through all the immigrations. You know. <laughs> when I travel, I can go to any country if I have him with me. <laughs> He's just so good with people. Whatever he says, they believe. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he has the power of the speech. You know, people have that power and they can just say something and it doesn't matter. And and, he, and the thing is, a lot of times he says something and doesn't do it, but you believe it anyway. <laughs> That's how good he is. <laughs> but he's a very sincere, wonderful devotee. So when he came, she came to the house, she admitted that she was forced to do this work looking for small little businesses to find discrepancies in their products so that she could slap a fine and then that fine would, that would help to, to pay for the debts that the government used. So that was the only reason she, and she said, if I didn't do it, I would lose my job. Yeah, she told the whole thing. So yeah, so this was one example of how, what is happening now, they're trying to get everyone's money. <laughs> whatever's left of it. So that's the whole idea because the governments are wasting money on so many things, useless things, wars and various types of, you know, padding the pockets of the bureaucrats with big, big salaries. You know, if they want to raise, then you get less money. <laughs> and that's just today's civilization. Anyway, that's a whole story. But what Prabhupada is saying here, that in order for our society to continue on to preach in Kali Yuga, we have to adopt a more simpler and natural lifestyle. And he, he preached that. He said, 50% of my mission is incomplete. He, there was four principles to Prabhupada's mission. The first was Harinam and book distribution. Prabhupada started the movement by doing Harinam everywhere, and then book distribution came. After that, he, he established the whole principle of Harijan. Harijan was to take people who are less qualified, train them, and make them qualified to become devotees of Lord. That is called initiation. Prabhupada was criticized for preaching in the West. He said, you know, his god brothers and even others said, you know, these people in the West, they're so fallen, you know. Uh, what is that? What's that word? Brashta, brashta, right? Brashta. Brashta means fallen, right? Yes. Corrupt. means corrupt. Corrupt. That's us. Yeah. <laughs> so when Prabhupada was preaching in Western countries, he was criticized for making Brahmins from people who are grown up in the Malachi country. When Mahatma Gandhi was asked, what do you think? Do you, what do you think about, um, let's see, what did he say? What do you think about Western civilization? Mahatma Gandhi said, yes, it's a good idea. They should be civilized. You, know? <laughs> you can see the Westerners are barbarians. This whole culture is barbarian culture. They eat their, they eat their mother. <laughs> they don't follow any rules and regulations. They do whatever they want, whenever they want. And they have nice houses and nice cars and they look civilized. And this is Western culture. And so don't buy into this whole program. Keep your culture. When Prabhupada was in Toronto and um, Montreal, he was saying, he was saying to the Indian population, which was really big, he was one of the, was a big force in Canada, he said, don't become Brashta. Don't give up your culture for this Western, this Western 
misculture. It has no value. There's no substance to Western life. Television, movies, cinemas, meat eating, uh, gambling, all kinds of sinful activities go on as the activities of the Western society. Fortunately, all of you have come to become devotees of Krishna. Unless people become devotees of Krishna, they're, they're swallowed up by this civilization. Pretty much it. Pretty much it. So Prabhupada was really strong. And then he said, he, he, he trained us to become devotees and ultimately also develop Brahminical qualities. And he also opened temples around the world. You'll see there's no other religious or spiritual society that has temples like us. Nowhere in the world. Radha Krishna temples everywhere in the world with nice worship of the Lord. Jagannath, Baladev, Subhadra, Sitaram, Lakshman, Hanuman, Gornitai, Radha Krishna. Srila Prabhupada really worked hard to establish these beautiful temples with nice deity worship. That was a big part of his mission. So holy books, holy, holy names, making devotees from malaches, uh, opening up temples, but then the fourth principle of Prabhupada's four-point program, which he adopted from the Gita Nagari screen scheme, which he, which he wrote in 1959, even before he came to America, farm communities, simple living, high thinking, living close to the land, getting everything you need from nature, and then spending most of your time chanting and engaging in devotional activity. That's Prabhupada. Prabhupada was sent by Krishna at this particular time to revolutionize the whole world at a time when the world is in the most dangerous and difficult situation. Prabhupada came. And Prabhupada could understand the future. He understand, he said, he said, you must establish these farm communities, otherwise our movement will not be able to sustain itself. The cities will fall apart, and then people will, will try to find some way to survive. And the cities are what? Economic development and sense gratification. And of course, there's, now there's a lot of crime. When you think of cities, you think of crime, right? You can't even walk down the streets in most cities when the, the government is supposed to give you protection, but you need more protection from the government than you do from, <laughs> from the criminals. Really, and it's not an exaggeration either. Tomorrow night I'll tell another story which illustrates the features of Kali Yuga. But there's one bright light in Kali Yuga, and of course there's a few. One is the chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. And associating with and serving devotees. These two principles are remain foundational in giving us the strain of course, worshiping the Lord in his transcendental form as Archivigraha, who's that's an incarnation of the Lord who's come to simply give us the opportunity to serve him directly in his form as Jagannath, Gornitai, Sitaram, Lakshman, Radha Krishna, like that. That is the mercy manifestation of the Lord, these deities. So, um, yeah. So when you look at things from a material point of view, they look quite bleak. <laughs> when you look at it from the spiritual point of view, they look very wonderful. But we need to see how we can uh, come closer to Srila Prabhupada's program in order, and also education, edu educating the children. You send children to these schools, and what do they learn? What do they learn? What do you guys learn? Two plus two is four. Two plus two is five. Hmm? Yes. <laughs> Two plus two is four. You can learn that at home without going to school. The first thing they learn is to become a rebel against the parents. Yeah, the first, that is, oh that's the first principle is to make sure 
you know, that anybody over 30 you should not listen to, right? <laughs> That's the number one teaching in the schools. <laughs> I grew up in that. We, we had a slogan, never trust anyone over 30. Yeah, that's what I grew up with that. And then I became over 30 and then I thought about it again. <laughs> <laughs> they, don't, they don't realize that those who say that, they're going to get over 30 also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the slogan when I was growing up. Never trust anyone over 30. They don't say that directly, but that's what they teach right from day one. Yeah. yeah. But they teach you how, what do they teach? They don't teach you anything. They teach you how to become stupid. There was a, there was a, they did a test on one boy. He was young. He was about six years old. And they found that by testing him, they found that this boy was a genius. He had all the qualities of become a genius. He went to school after 10 years. His, the percentage of his intelligence dropped from the 97 to 5%. He became stupid by going to school. Yeah, you do you become stupid. <laughs> Bhakti Vinod Thakur says, modern day education and slaughterhouses. What did the slaughter mean? They, they destroy the good qualities of the living beings. A person is known by their character, not by what you can do what you can do is an extension of your character but that 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 is not taught in schools they teach you various types of ways to make money right yeah that's it you go to school so you can get a job and if you don't get a job then you're a dog dog means you wag your tail saying please mr master give me some money um i'm 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 feeling really funny. I need some money. Please give me a job. Ruff, ruff. <laughs> yes. They teach you how to become slave by different different ways. Yeah, they teach they teach you how not to become human. <laughs> All of you have good qualities because you're devotees of Krishna. Otherwise, if you weren't, you'd be robbing the place right now. <laughs> Really, it's Krishna consciousness is the only because Krishna consciousness includes everything material too. It's not just a secular, a spiritual thing, and then the material is a separate thing. Krishna consciousness is a culture of how to live life, and not just how to worship the Lord, but how to live life. Yes. Uh, coming from a pious background and practicing devotee, and some of the audience also may be feeling the same question that we want to help cow protection. We want to really participate in that. But the society in which we are living, we are constrained not to do that. For example, even though uh, I have a one acre land, I could not have cows here. Yeah. Whereas in India, if I would have had one acre land, we could easily have four or five cows in that one land. Yeah. So we had a very difficult choice of uh, choosing uh, do we do preaching by staying in a city or you go away from city where agriculture land is allowed, I think but you then you don't really get a preaching activity? I think you should stay where you are, but at the same time become Krishna conscious. But what we need to do is to find more opportunities to associate and serve each other and serve the Lord and educate each other, including our children, in the values of what is proper living, uh, how to live life in such a way that you can become happy and educated at the same time. But you should also have a backup plan <laughs> that when things do collapse, you're not lost. A backup plan means where will I go if, you know, if the cities collapse? And according to Srila Prabhupada, and this is will happen very we can't say soon we don't know we don't like to be doomsday prophets but we know that this lifestyle is not sustainable it's just not it's based on the wrong principle if you if you build a house and it has and the foundation is not structured right whatever you build on top of it will also be weak 
So the, the foundation for this society is sense gratification and economic development. That is not a human society. Human society is God consciousness, cow protection, and dominical culture. That is actually a human society. But they're killing the cows, and therefore they're getting, as we read from that verse from the seventh canton, because, because you can kill cows for so many decades, and after a while, the sinful reactions build in such a way, then you have wars, you have pestilence, and you have so many problems. People don't connect it. They think, oh, we, all we have to do is read it just the way we live, and we can solve our problems. But that's, that'll never work. Because the earth is the provider and also the, the punisher of the living entities. So when we don't live according to God's laws, Mother Nature punishes people. Therefore, one of the punishments is disease. And everybody's sick nowadays. Even if they're not sick from the virus, they're sick from something. And what causes, what causes the most sickness? Anxiety. If you're happy, you're healthy. If you're not happy, or if you're in anxiety, you are gradually wearing down your health because the mind is connected directly with the rest of the body. When the body and mind is not happy, the body also gets the, the effects of that. So stay happy. That's why we say chant and be happy. <laughs> That's one way to be happy. Associate with devotees and engage in devotional service and develop relationships with each other in a very intimate way. And then by that, you develop a spiritual family. We are, Prabhupada's created what is called the spiritual family and not just a bunch of people who are spiritual practitioners. It's like a family. It's meant to work together in that same mood, to serve each other and to serve Krishna by serving each other and serving Krishna also both like that. And that, that's the foundation for happiness. And then, of course, there are other things, but we have to fight against the, the negativity that surrounds us in so many different ways. Therefore, we need to come up with alternative plans like that in order to live. I could show you a very scary movie, but I won't. <laughs> I can tell you about it. Should I tell you about it? Yes. The United States government, not the government, but different agencies are being told to send letters to farmers and telling farmers to destroy their food crops. It's documented. They're giving letters to farmers, destroy your food crops, and we'll give you twice as much money that your food crop is worth. And if you don't destroy it, we'll send in a man to destroy it for you. I have it on film. These are the, the farmers are talking about this. This is not this is not a reporter from the outside. These are the people who are getting the letters. They're saying, why are we getting these letters? Destroy our food crop. Why? They're trying to restrict the food crops so people become more dependent on factory farms and big Monsanto, Cargill, and Bad, these various corporations, which are trying to take the whole food supply and, and control it from the, the government point of view. And therefore, the government controls your food, they control you completely. So that's the program. Bill Gates is buying up farmland everywhere. And what is he doing with it? He's just buying it up and not using it so farmers can't have farmland. Yeah, these are all, there's a plan to, to kill the food supply all around the world and to restructure the whole economic interest by legislating everything from the top down. So the people will be simply dependent on governments for everything, everything. You have no, everything you need will come through government agencies. You can't do anything on an individual level. That's their whole plan. <clears throat> this could call it, and it's demoniac. <laughs> you come right down to it, it's demoniac. So uh, that's why Prabhupada said, get these farms together. 
if there's two ways to have wealth. One is precious metals and two is land. If you have land, keep it, don't sell it. Don't live in rented places. You're just throwing money away. Buy land and use the land as much as you can. Land is wealth. Animals are also a kind of equity also. Of course, you can't use them so much within the cities. But Prabhupada's program is to establish these farms. These are the, he said, this is the future of the movement and the future of the world. And cities are not places of inhabitants for anybody. <laughs> of course, we live out here. It's more like the countryside. I can see when I look outside, I see the trees are so beautiful here. The environment looks so nice. And but we put these, these, these houses in the middle of all this stuff. And that's nice. But <clears throat> we're still very much dependent on agencies outside of ourselves for whatever we need for food, for water, for electricity, for gas, for everything. So that dependency might cause us to become more and more controlled from the outside. And if it fa fails, then you don't have any of these things. Prabhupada said in 1940s, the, the government of India created an artificial famine. Maybe some of you might have been aware of that. Why did they do that? They made sure there was no food supply in India. Why did they do that? In order to get people to join the army in order to fight the wars. The soldiers, the men didn't have any way to provide for their families, so they joined the army and that way they could get food in order and in that way the, the war was able to go on. So that was an artificial famine created by the government of India. That's documented. That's not something I'm making up. <laughs> I don't know if you're aware of that. British using just that, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, British, they were like that. Yeah. So that's what they're trying to do now. They're trying to create this artificial famine by destroying food crops. So we had a meeting in Slovenia amongst the devotees were thinking about stocking food there. But Europe is still a breadbasket of, of much, much, much growth. The United States is being attacked by all of these corporations. This is the focus here. Anyway, I don't want to get too much into politics because this is not the basis. But I'm just saying that we, Prabhupada's program is the natural program for, for the future. Uh, try to live more simply. So continue the way you're going now, but always have a backup plan. If things do not, where would you go if everything collapses? We have our farms, we have our places in Mayapur, we have places in Vrindavan, we have Hungary, we have a few other places that are developing self-sufficient farms, but we need more of them. We need more of these farms. And to live on the farm, I mean, after living in the cities most of your life, it's not easy, right? You think, oh, my God, I, you know, my grandmother lived like that, but that's not for me. I just like to plug in my, you know, computer. You may not be able to do that after some time. So, yeah, I'm just saying that we should have some backup plan where if things do start getting to the point that there is a need for change, look to this more simple lifestyle. And then and you can build that mood by building the community here, by having more Krishna consciousness programs and discussing these things as one of the key features of discuss. How can we avoid, you know, being exploited from the outside so we can spend more time practicing Krishna consciousness and, and avoiding all of these difficulties. Because governments come and go, <laughs> but people remain. Okay, time. Time doesn't, time also goes. There's an old saying, time, time goes in one direction and the 
Time flies, but it doesn't say goodbye. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just keeps moving. So I'll stop here. I hope I didn't cause too much difficulty with this lecture. <laughs> but think about it in terms of where, as a society, we can find solace or resources as things become worse and worse, and things will get worse. There's no, I can tell you that for sure. Things are, are getting worse. There's a program to destroy all small businesses in the United States. You can see it now, it's happening. They want to, they want to get rid of all small business and make everything on the corporate level where all the corporations are more or less the main suppliers of everything. And so if you go around the different countries, especially I was in the UK, devotees were telling me small businesses are closing like crazy. They're pushing them out and they're also trying it here to, to, to cripple small businesses so people, you know, depend more and more on these big, big corporations for everything they need. It's the corporate state. That's what they're trying to create, a corporate state where big business runs the world and not governments or people. It's all big business. <laughs> okay. So we have one devotee in Charlotte, Pavitra Gaura Prabhu. You stayed with him when you came first time in Charlotte. I remember. So that devotee has taken a bold step. He acquired four acres of land and he is cultivating his own food to some extent. And we are so happy that he is able to move forward in that direction. We hope that more and more devotees will really try to yeah, yeah, speak to him. Maybe he needs some help. <laughs> yeah. Then maybe some of some of us could also think about moving in that more Latin, more natural lifestyle. So Pavitra Gaura Prabhu, thank you for your uh, bold step. And if you want to come and meet Maharaj and discuss about your plans, that would be very nice. Mm -hmm. We have one devotee, his name is Bhakti Raghav Swami. He is one of the main devotees in ISKCON who's working to develop these farm communities. He's traveling around preaching this. Try to find some of his books. He's, you know, he only talks about cow protection and self-sufficiency, natural living like that. There's a Bhakti, I'm sure you might have heard of a Bhakti Raghava Swami Maharaj. Yeah. When you learn the value of a cow, you'll be surprised how, how precious cows are. They're really, really the, the sustainable because Vedic culture means cow protection, Brahminical culture, worship of the Supreme Personality of God. And these are the three points of a human culture. Okay, thank you very much and uh, Hare Krishna. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai, Shrikanath Baladev Subhadra Maharani Ki Jai. Venkatesh Balaji Ki Jai. Shri Maharani Ki Jai. So thank you all the devotees on the call. Um, I know it was a bit challenging in the beginning. I hope you heard something and the sound quality was okay for you to hear this. Thank you, Prabhu. And uh, just a small announcement.